Hi there. Thanks for joining me on Rethink Real Estate for Good. I'm Eve Picker, and I'm on a mission to make real estate work for everyone. I love real estate. Real estate makes places good or bad, rich or poor, beautiful or not. In this show, I'm interviewing the disruptors, those creative thinkers and doers that are shrugging off the status quo in order to build better for everyone. Meet Julie Bargman, the inaugural recipient of the Cornelia Hahn Oberlander International Landscape Architecture Prize. This prize has been described as the landscape architecture equivalent of a Pritzker Prize, so it's a really big deal. What makes this most exciting is the work that is being honoured. In 1992, Julie founded Dirt Studio, which stands for Dump It Right There. She was intent on regenerating contaminated and forgotten urban and post-industrial sites. And it all began near Pittsburgh at the Vintendale Reclamation Park, a 25-acre park on a former coal mine. The end result became the early poster child of her business a model for bioremediation that was featured in the Cooper Hewitt National Design Triennial. Today, she is often referred to as the fairy godmother of industrial wastelands, as she crafts amazing new landscapes out of the contaminated and toxic sites she works on. You'll want to hear more. If you'd like to join me in my quest to rethink real estate, there are two simple things you can do. Share this podcast and go to rethinkrealestateforgood.co where you can subscribe to be the first to hear about my podcasts, blog posts, and other goodies. Julie, it's really an incredible honor to have you on my show today. Thank you for joining me. Yes, I am honored. I love that you chose a landscape architect to enter into this realm of speaking about real estate. I'm, I'm, I'm actually quite passionate about it um, in, in terms of what landscape architecture's uh, role is within it. So. so, you know, I agree with you. And too often, I think architects think about landscape as an afterthought, but it should yeah. really be an integral part of building and design. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to start by saying you studied to be an artist. So yeah. where did your fascination with degraded and toxic mm. landscapes begin? <laughs> well, I often tell the story of, um, of driving, you know, with my, you know, riding in a station wagon down the New Jersey Turnpike and, you know, being completely fascinated by the refineries. I don't know what it was. It was just kind of this perverse you know, attraction, you know, wondering like, what is going on there, you know, and who's working in there and, you know, what's it like in there? And um, so I think that was a little kernel, you know, of it. Uh, And then I just kept finding myself attracted to um, working landscapes and working cities. So, you know, off I went to Pittsburgh uh, to study sculpture at Carnegie Mellon. And I love that city. I just, when I was there, um, the steel mills were still along the rivers, you know, they were still belching smoke. It still smelled, you know, which I thought was great. It was all part of it. Um, as an artist, I, I actually went into the steel mills, you know, cause I wanted to see how they worked and who was working there. And I think that really did it. I still had no idea what I was going to do with my life. When later, you know, I discovered what landscape architecture was and that I could be kind of venturing into all these different types of landscapes, uh, that was it, you know, and um, not that landscape architecture at the point was kind of working in working landscapes, but I was kind of determined to do that. Yeah, but there's a lot of very precious landscape architecture out there and what you've, yeah, and I think you really work in some of the worst and t- most toxic landscapes mm-hmm. to be found. And what about that is really interesting to you? Well, you know, I, I, 
I think, first of all, I, I, I think the range that I like to be clear about with my work is that it does go to the biggest and the baddest, you know, to the toxic, but also to the degraded, you know, that is, you know, part of the kind of repertoire of, of industry, right? It can be, whew, you know, wicked. Um, and uh, sometimes it can be kind of, quote unquote, inert, but still impactful, you know, and um the toxic ones for a long time i did projects with the um the epa um and i was working on super fun sites uh which are the sites that are designated you know as kind of the biggest and the baddest i think what i brought to that which was completely unknown right then by the epa for years and maybe to date is the kind of cultural and social aspect of these landscapes you know, they were fo totally focused on the remediation, right? The quote unquote cleaning up, you know, of these landscapes. But I was like, well, come on, there's kind of more to it than that. There are generations that still live around these sites, you know, whose grandfather probably died, you know, black lung, you know, and so there are connections there. And I actually stopped working <laughs> with the EPA because I just felt like I was banging my head against a wall where it was difficult to integrate that kind of factor. They always felt a, an enormous amount of urgency in kind of doing the fix and getting out of there versus actually engaging the community in what might be an incremental regeneration of that site. So they're quite myopic. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like they're focused on yeah. fixing a problem, whereas what you saw was a future asset, really, for the community. Correct. Yeah. You know, I don't know if you remember way back to spell check. Oh, yes. Yeah. When I used to type in remediation, it would say correcting a fault. And then if you type in regeneration, it says creating a new. And I was like, boom, that's it. I'm never going to use the word remediation anymore, you know, because that's not what this work should necessarily be about. So I read somewhere that the Ventondale Reclamation Park, which is actually, it's a 35-acre site near Pittsburgh, was pivotal. And yeah. But I'd love to know why. Well, you know, at the time, um, I was really, really interested in this work. I did, a, you know, as part of my academic research, because that's around the time I started teaching, you know, I did a tour around the United States just to kind of get a sense of, you know, what was going on. And, you know, I got this call, you know, kind of out of the blue, you know, to join this team to work on Vittendale and well, actually to work on, on acid mine drainage, right, which is the byproduct of, you know, of coal mining. And we were looking for uh, to actually look at prototypes and models for, you know, you can imagine there are so many towns, right, post mining towns, former mining towns you know, that are plagued by acid mine drainage. So to be on this team was my dream come true. It was multidisciplinary. There was an artist, hydrogeologist, historian, who I, you know, historians are, I like love, you know, scientists too. I love them too. And the community involved and AmeriCorps volunteers. It was just this collective effort, you know, to look at, basically making the transformation of acid mine drainage visible, not behind a fence, you know, let the community know the, the one of the byproducts too is yellow boy. Yellow boy is yellow boy. This is what it is, you know, and this is you being a part of the next evolution of that landscape. Much like I was saying with the EPA in terms of, of trying to advocate for the community to be involved and not even maybe intensely involved, but at least a participant or a witness to um, what was going on in terms of the transformation here of a acid mine drainage. That was, uh, to me, a, a breakthrough uh, in uh, in projects. And for me, it was a breakthrough in landscape architecture. Uh, this coincided, by the way, uh, with a lot of of the great projects that are in the Ruhr Valley of um, of Germany, um, so what we did was was in essence make that science visible, so that they could say, "Oh, I get it. 
you know, the acid mine drainage is coming from mine, you know, number one, and it's going through this, you know, this uh, system and it's coming out as biologically rich and being drained um, back into the streams. So I basically, you know, I call it an ecological washing machine. Um, and yes. that's what was right near a bike trail. So uh, lots of folks are able to see it. And nicely enough, it remains a model for the region. Interesting. So when you work on a project like this, how does your work begin? What Where does the inspiration come from? Mm. Oh, the history. Absolutely. Every time. Every time it's the history of the site, you know, which means the history of the people there. I just can never think about starting uh, a project without really knowing, you know, what happened there before, because I feel that you cannot really propose anything about the future of the site unless you know it's past, you know, because it's, it is all part of an evolution. It makes the process inclusive. Um, it's what I, you know, was thinking about in terms of private development, uh, infusing the public in it for the public good. Um, it's the history. It's the history. The history levels the playing field in terms of everyone who's working on a project because there's a bigger story and a bigger picture. I feel that that we want to be responsible to. So is there an example of a project where the history took you in an unexpected direction or? Hmm. Well, <laughs> oh man, I guess I flash right to Detroit and I'm working with a wonderful, wonderful young uh, developer there. And he is doing amazing things of investing in the public realm, uh, in the neighborhood, along with, you know, his, his private uh, developments. And, you know, it was our, our, like our, I call it our first date, you know, we just, I was came out and I, I was like, okay, you know, let's look at the site and we're standing in front of like a blank, seemingly blank uh, parking lot covered with concrete. And he said, what would you do? And I knew that there was a historic engine house that was there. And I was like, hmm. And it was raised in the seventies. And I was like, hmm. I think that's when they pushed, you know, the buildings into their basements. And I turned to him and I said, dig. And he went, okay. And he had a front end loader um, there the next day. <laughs> and I just was crossing my fingers about what would come up because I wanted to, you know, I thought about integrating it into this public park, this community park we were making. And uh, sure enough, beautiful redstone uh, came up to make these kind of uh, scattered little terraces. And then one day uh, up came a giant piece of sandstone that said 1893 on it. Oh, wow. I, I was like, oh, <laughs> I was both very happy and very relieved. I was like, that's it. That's it. We found it we found the material evidence of that history and the park suddenly became actually quite old. I can't tell you, I just got goosebumps again. I do every time when I think about it, the developer, you know, he tells the story to everyone and the story kind of spreads and everyone is knowing, you know, an essential part of history of their neighborhood of core city. That was unexpected and wonderful. <laughs> that does sound wonderful. Is this the developer who's working on the Caterpillar housing? The, yes. Mm -hmm. the, yes. The very unusual architecture as well. Quonset yes. huts, right? Yes. He is having some architects do a little twist on Quonset huts because uh, he wants to take something that's very affordable and make beautiful spaces that are not terribly expensive so that they're, you know, accessible. Uh, for more folks. So he's quite adventurous that way. And he, uh, you know, I just feel like, you know, his name's Philip Kafka, has his heart so much in the right place. I mean, his, the proportion of like, I can't remember, he loves trees. And I, I can't remember what number he's up to, but he's, he's very proud of the number of trees that he's uh, planted in uh, Core City. For instance, the caterpillar, 
um, I think we planted 200, maybe it's 300. Oh. I can't remember. You know, he goes 200 trees and eight units. <laughs> That's how wow. he thinks of it. Do you find that you need to educate people on this? Because this makes me think immediately of the people around where I live who are who are mowing down enormous old historic trees yeah um because they want a flat piece of land to build their house on sure but yeah but the tree seems to be the most valuable asset they have i don't Abs absolutely it. i mean everyone is quite used to a tabula rasa you know it's the kind of easiest way to go and that's why you know again i you know his, it, when i emphasize history of the site you right the trees are very much that history of the site and you can't replace that history, you know, right? It, you just can't, you know. It, no. uh, I mean, some history is buried underground, like, you know, th that park in Core City, and some is just looming large, you know. And, and, it, and so this is where I constantly go back to history and I constantly go back to telling stories because most people like stories and most people like to be part of a story. And th that's basically the form of education. You know, like I'm flashing to working with Ford Motor Company on the River Rouge plant. And it took telling the story about the Coke ovens, which they wanted to wipe out, you know, to one say we did our homework and said, you know, that part of it is toxic. That part is not, you know. So we did that homework, the environmental homework. Um, and then when we did the history, we were reminding them that they were looking at a piece of incredible history of this Rouge River plant being the first manufacturing plant in the world, in the world, you know. So it occurred to us and they kind of came to that that was too important a story you know it's was just too rich and too significant to so many people so many generations that worked at Ford's they called it Ford's to obliterate and they didn't have to they didn't really have to and that that was the education part too you know I called it homework and I found that you know <laughs> especially as a woman you know I needed to, you know, kill them with knowledge. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, just say, hey, was it easy? <laughs> uh, sometimes more than other. I, I have to say, I, I even changed my tone. You know, I think early on, I was pretty insistent. And then I, I think I was more empathetic, you know, to the folks who were really dealing with the EPA and yes, and a lot of pressure to remediate. And I encourage them. I'm like, come on, let's, you know, let's talk about this. Let's show them a careful mapping, you know, because they didn't know how to map. You know, they showed the, you know, the flow diagram of the Coke ovens. And we did another map of it and said, look, you know, this is the part that's harmful. So we need to deal with it in another way. And this other stuff we can deal in another way, you know. So you don't need a tabula rasa. You can, you know, have your cake, your Coke ovens and, and you're, huh. you know, there we put remediation fields and remediation gardens, which they just loved, you know, they just, woo, you know, they put it on their website woo, in all caps, you know, so. Yeah, well, it tells an amazing story. When you work on a very large project, what, what does mm. your team look like? Oh, <laughs> wow. Um, well, sometimes I work with another landscape architect, a dirt studio is modeled after an artist's studio. So the most folks I've had been, you know, working with me is maybe five. Um, so if it's a really large project, I need, you know, I look for a, a bit more firepower. Mm -hmm. And so that's really fun working with another landscape architect. Always engineers are on there. And I think more unusually um, is getting scientists on the team. I always insist about that, you know, like when the, we're starting the client, I'm like, no, we, we need this scientist, um, which yes. they, you know, they didn't know would be at all necessary. And like I said earlier, I, which is really unusual for a client to hear, um, is to have a historian 
you know, on the, on the project. Uh, and, you know, and then, you know, when I'm talking about like scientists too, it's, it's just not even kind of like one type of scientist, soil scientist, wildlife biologist, you know, that when I had a phytoremediation scientist um, and it's, I have to tell you, it is, it is so wonderful. I mean, my, you know, learning curve is always like vertical, you know, on these projects um, the most fun, by bringing it? in. Yeah. 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 It's Fabulous. Incredible. So, you know, you've done a really broad range of projects. Like there's some for retail clients and yes, some re remediation. What What are some examples of the projects you've taken on, what they were and what they became? <laughs> the most kind of, in a way, obvious because they're out there, you know, retail client was Urban Outfitters. And with Urban Outfitters, it was really, you know, interesting. They were moving from Rittenhouse Square, you know, into tight little quarters out to what was really at the time the hinterlands, you know, of the Philadelphia Navy Yard. And, you know, I worked very, very closely with the founder, uh, Dick Hain, uh, which was, you know, a blessing and a curse. <laughs> He's quite something, uh, but we got along famously. And uh, for a project that was coming from uh, some folks that are so aesthetically based to be kind of more, um, more like historically based and environmentally based was, you know, that was a challenge. Um, I quite frankly learned at some point not to even talk about what I was doing, what I was proposing in terms of history and the environment. Um, it just wasn't of, you know, uh, enormous interest to them. You know, as I say, I, I snuck sustainability out, you know, in the you know back door and, I hope, um, I hope you know, listening. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Dick is so cool. You know, he won't mind. He knows I love him. We used to, you know, speak our secret language of Latin of plants because he loved plants. So we, we just, we just got along great. And, and he was cool. He just was like, yeah, bring it on. And he never really asked that many questions. There was an amazing amount of trust through between us. I, and that's something that I can't speak enough about is, is, as you probably know from projects, the trust is enormous. And uh, so with the, you know, the urban project, um, there wasn't uh, an enormous amount of remediation that needed to be done. Some lead soils um, had to be dealt with and, you know, lead is tricky, man. So they didn't want to go through the process of other types of remediation. So one okay way of dealing with it is, is actually to encapsulate it. Um, so it was encapsulated. But the, the big thing with Urban Outfitters that was tricky was when it was going into like phase four and being built around the historic dry dock that was right in the center of this gorgeous, you know, water body from way back when for the huge ships, I found myself in that precarious place of kind of, I say, I always quite kind of say defending the public realm within a private enterprise. That's when I have to say, I think de design gets really tricky, you know, because there was really kind of like a teetering point where literally something that we would do, we were forming, um, would feel too private, you know, and how is it that we could make this campus that was private, but parts of it could be shared. So that's, I have to say, a big deal. It's like pushing against a gated community, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I have to say that's what I feel like, you know, in, in landscape architecture, you know, because we're, you know, dealing with ground, you know, and I, I, I know this is the case in most development. And I've had projects where I'm just realizing I'm picturing a good old fax I sent sometime where it said, I quit, you know, um, because, you know, the commitment to the public realm wasn't there, you know, which, you know, I'm learning from uh, you know, working with Kafka in, you know, in Detroit is so essential. Maybe I knew it intuitively so essential of, uh, in terms of, of, of building that quality, you know, of, 
of common ground that then makes sense, you know, for the individual happily living in their, you know, private abode. So, yeah. That probably touches on my next question. You've written about the overlap between poor and minority communities, mm. and contaminated soils, and I, I certainly mm -hmm. know of that. Yeah. I mean, I have to ask, how and why did that happen? And how do we fix it? Why, why is it that mm -hmm. poor and minority communities have had the brunt of, of this mess, basically? You think about industries and how they would kind of most conveniently cite themselves. You know, and when industries were getting up and running before all the environmental, you know, legislation starting in 1973, and when you think about it, my God, that's not that long ago. You know, most of the industries started up then. You know, they were looking, you know, for floodplains to discharge all of their nasty stuff. And they were looking at a lot of land that did not have a lot of value to you know, have people be downwind and uh, downstream from nasty stuff. So uh, poor soils, poor people, they go together. I mean, it's just a thing to be conscious of now, which I think a lot of folks are. I mean, there is the kind of whole movement of environmental justice. Industries are being held accountable. I like to think that, you know, the ground that we live on is, you know, and work on is, is becoming more just. And I think it is. I think I I I like to think it is. I I, I should say it should be, uh, because I think folks are much more aware. You know, if you asked somebody who, who, what a Superfund site was, you know, what ten years ago, fifteen years ago, they wouldn't know what you're talking about. The level of you know environmental awareness has just gone up so high. But the next thing is the action to enforce it and act upon it. And I don't think that most folks in what the things that they're proposing, you know, you look at, you know, developers working in you know, Richmond or, you know, any working city and, you know, their, their projects are going to be scrutinized. Yeah. 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 I think that's true. So it's, there's been a definite shift, but I always wonder whether it's still too easy to forget about the poor communities. Um, <laughs> And, you know, and if yeah. sufficient funds are being deployed to make those contaminated lands into assets there, yeah. someone has to start a project, right? They have to have the funds to start it. And yes, um, yes, I don't think that's equitable yet. Right. So, for instance, you know, I'm flashing back to Detroit where I've, you know, done these projects and I'm thinking about how, you know, um, and you probably know about some of these, Eve, is, you know, these deals are being struck with developers where, you know, it's like, okay, you know, we'll sell you this land, you know, but you're also, you know, going to be responsible for this land, you know, which will be, you, you know, you, you have to make something there to benefit the existing often poor community. I'm optimistic about initiatives like that. It's kind of, or it is forcing developers who I think could very well be just carpetbaggers, you know, in a disinvested, depopulated city like Detroit to make them more civic-minded. I was running around Detroit with the former planning director, Maurice Cox, you know, and there's one, you know, man there who's, who's planting a bunch of tree farms. And, you know, I was kind of disgusted, you know, as much as, you know, I love trees, you know, and, and Maurice asked me, he goes, what's the problem? And I said, I know it maybe, you know, improves the, you know, the quality, the, the, you know, value of the land here, but who is it doing that for? And what at all about it is civic, you know, I'm like, where are the trees along the street? Where are the da 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 da? And I just, I kind of went on my right. rant um, to just, you know, dissect it for what, public good a private enterprise was doing 
you know, and he was like, oh, and I said, you should insist. You should insist that, you know, yeah, the city will sell you this land, but you need to do this, this and this for the public realm. I always feel this is a little bit of a problem with our political structure because someone who who has some power to make these decisions may have been an insurance agent in a past life. They don't necessarily have any training on landscape or architecture or, yeah. or urban design or how to make better civic places. And they're really given enormous power to control what happens in those places. And yeah, that's a, that's a shame. I'm sorry. Did you save like planning, planning folks? Um, well, planning folks are a little bit better because to yeah. be a planning person, you've got to you've yeah. got to have some background in planning. No, I'm thinking like a mayor or someone on city council who has oh my god the power yeah. to make make a vote and doesn't really have any of the necessary education oh or understanding, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I I have to jump in here to you know, I mean, I'm so excited to say this because I always say like I have a huge crush on mayors. You know, in that, um, and that happened from being part of the Mayor's Institute on City Design. Oh, yes. Yeah. And I was on many sessions and blah, 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 but uh, regional and national. And I, um, I, I just think it's, they're brilliant. I just really think, you know, uh, having been in there and, you know, just one on one or, you know, just the mayors, you know, talking about, a specific project, but um, some more in general, just everyone. I, I know I saw that light bulb go up above their head and they were like, we are the architect of this city. You know, if we can't make an informed decision, we better surround ourselves, you know, themselves with somebody who could help them. Yeah. That's a great outcome. Yeah. So I want to ask you about this incredible honor that's been bestowed Mm -hmm. on you. You're Mm -hmm. the first inaugural laureate for the Oberlander International Landscape Architecture Prize. Um, It's not just national, it's international. Yeah. What does that mean to you? Well, it means a lot to me, obviously, but uh, I can't not be. But for me, it's, it's what it means to the discipline, my discipline. And that has to do with, I think, what I might represent. And that is much like Cornelia Oberlander, who it's named for. I decided I could take risks and I wanted to take risks. I had the advantage of teaching. So I always say I was kept by the university. But what I found is that there was something that the jury was saying in terms of the value of having a critical practice, not a commercial one, having one that was going to get out there. And the other thing was to influence a good many students after 27 years of teaching. Um, So that was heartening to me, you know, about um, receiving the prize. I'm just enormously proud and I'm enormously proud of my discipline. You know, I'm hoping that what my getting the prize communicates is for people to to go ahead you know be fearless kick some ass you know (laughs) just (laughs) do it don't be afraid yeah so so I have to ask you is there anyone following in your footsteps anyone who's coming up young in the ranks who's fearless doing really interesting things yeah there are former students who are doing it, you know, I even swell up with pride right now. My former um, associate, David Hill of Hill Works is just doing some amazing projects. He's based in Auburn, Alabama. And another former student and also dear friend of an architect, I've known her since she was nine years old, more Rock Castle and Ross Alzheimer with 10 by 10 architects. Um, Chloe Hawkins. Nicely enough, I think I can list a good number, you know, of folks, you know, and also I think that I have kind of a solidarity, a a group that is kind of a support group. I think of Kate Orff. Uh, Kate is absolutely fantastic and she's doing unbelievable work. And I can't think of, you know, names right now. They're out there. And I just know that You know, there were a lot of emails that just say, you go, girl, you know, (laughs) 
<laughs> and so you got a little bit of prize money. What do you plan to do with that? Ah, okay. Well, <laughs> I'm looking outside at my Bambi, my Airstream Bambi. She's named Cornelia. And um, <laughs> she, she and I are going to take that cross-country trip that I took it will be what? What's nineteen ninety three? What is the arithmetic? But it's a lot of time. Um, that that mining tour that I told you about. Um, yes. So I want to do that again. Um, I want to stop at dirt projects along the way, see how they're doing. You know, visit with you know the old pals that I built it with. Hit some more Rust Belt cities. I have a project in Pittsburgh to stop at. Wow. And, you know, I think I'm just going to keep going west and, you know, look at some big holes in the ground again. Um, I liked them. So uh, so I'll be really interested to see what uh, what comes out of them. Yeah, um, I hope so. The Cultural Landscape Foundation, who has bestowed uh, the prize, um, I'm hoping they will, you know, put together a some sort of blog or some sort of something, you know, of of my time on the road. That'd be fun. Well, I've really thoroughly enjoyed um, talking with you. It's um, your work is fabulous, and I, I can't thank you thank enough. You. And I can't wait to see what's next. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Okay. It's been a, a privilege. I hope you enjoyed today's guest and our deep dive. You can find out more about this episode or others you might have missed on the show notes page at rethinkrealestateforgood.co. There's lots to listen to there. Please support this podcast and all of the great work my guests do by sharing it with others, posting about it on social media, or leaving a rating and a review. To catch all the latest from me, you can follow me on LinkedIn. Even better, if you're ready to dabble in some impact investing, head on over to smallchange.co, where I spend most of my time. A special thanks to David Allardyce for his excellent editing of this podcast and original music. And a big thanks to you for spending your time with me today. We'll talk again soon, but for now, this is Eve Picker signing off to go make some change. Thank you.